Today on The Bottom Line, avoiding stocks that could get Amazon. More skepticism about President Trump's economic plan and the other huge problem with healthcare. Plus, Julian Emanuel of UBS on the market and FANG. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Bottom Line. I'm Henry Blodgett. A big thank you to Fidelity Investments for presenting the show, as always. There is a new investment theme on Wall Street. It is called Avoid Getting Amazoned. And this goes beyond actually owning Amazon and some of the other hot technology stocks, the FANG stocks and FAMG stocks with Microsoft, depending on how you go with it. This is actually about avoiding companies that might get clobbered. And this theme really took hold when Amazon announced it was going to buy Whole Foods. We saw immediate impact in other retailer stocks like Walmart, Kroger, and others. Folks assumed, wow, Amazon's going to come up with some magical technology solution, delivering our groceries from Whole Foods. This is going to impact the rest of the industry. Folks got very worried about that. And there have been other examples of the same thing. There was a story that Amazon was talking to Nike about directly selling Nikes. Dick's Sporting Goods got clobbered on that story. Folks in the UK are shorting the stocks of retailers there, fearing the big e-commerce boom. We had a stock called Grubhub, which does technology automated delivery from restaurants in New York and other cities. Morgan Stanley came out and said, careful, they may get Amazon because Amazon restaurants is really taking hold. I have to say as a fervent Amazon customer and shareholder, I was startled to learn that there even was such a thing as Amazon restaurants. So the amount of hold that it's taking you know, may be overstated there, but interesting to know that Amazon's in that. And then this week as well, a REIT called Store Capital received an investment from Warren Buffett, who basically the speculation is invested because Store Capital has arranged its, port its portfolio to invest in the real estate of companies that provide services and therefore are not as likely to get Amazon. So even Warren Buffett apparently getting in on the action. Fortunately, the moment he invested, the stock went up and it immediately got downgraded as a result. So once again, Warren gets in ahead of the rest of us. Um, the only share I, the story I would share on this, going back, obviously the theme of avoiding bad things that might happen is a, a very sound investment one. But I will say that late 1990s when I was an Amazon analyst, I remember going around to talk to clients with another analyst and we were talking then about avoiding retailers that might get Amazon. And, and that mattered for a year, but then ultimately it didn't matter for about 10 years. I'd say as an Amazon shareholder, no company can do everything. Amazon is already doing a remarkable number of things well. There is no way it will be able to do everything. So perhaps the fear of getting Amazon is getting a little overhyped at this point. This week has brought us another diss to Trumponomics, specifically the projected economic growth rate under the Trump administration. You may remember that candidate Trump promised an economic growth rate of 4%. President Trump, his team is tamping down expectations, saying we're hoping to get to 3% economic growth, which would be a nice acceleration from where we are now. But this week, the International Monetary Fund came out and said, no, no, it's only going to be 2%. In fact, they even cut their growth estimate. Um, why did they do this? Well, they did this in conjunction, first of all, with something called an Article 4 consultation. International Monetary Fund exists to lend money to countries that need it. They do evaluations in the context of that. They make recommendations. And where they came out after consulting a little bit with the United States leadership um, is that the objectives of the Trump administration are laudable. Accelerate business growth, remove regulation, and so forth. But the specific policies that are being contemplated are not likely to actually make that happen, in part because the policies are not particularly well detailed or thought out, at least as far as the IMF is concerned. And specifically, they said, look, the problem in the United States is that economic gains are not being shared. They are going to simply the richest and only a little bit to the folks who actually spend most of the money in the economy. That has to be fixed. This is something we've talked about a lot on the bottom line. High levels of poverty in the country. Medicaid cuts under the new Senate and House health care bills will exacerbate this because Medicaid flows right into hospitals and others. Um, and the Russia and the health care imbroglio are slowing things down. So the IMF basically said, look, we're not looking for any miracle cure. We're not expecting any acceleration. 
And then they point out that the big problem for the economy in terms of growth rate is that the U.S. economy is actually near full employment. And economic growth is a product of the number of people who are working and the length of time that they're working and the productivity with which they're working, the amount that they're producing per hour. And with the labor force growing at a much slower rate than it has been in the past, the IMF says the only thing that is really going to drive economic growth and accelerate it is much more immigration. And one of the things the Trump administration obviously is focused on is controlling immigration, not necessarily slowing it down, but certainly controlling it. So it seems to run counter to that as well. So yet another skeptic of the Trump administration's promises about future economic growth. On this week's bottom line, the other unfortunate thing about the United States healthcare system. Senate delayed its new health care bill, lots of unhappiness about the bill, polling approval is only 17% of Americans actually like it, um, huge cuts to Medicaid in it, 20 million projected to lose their health insurance over the next 10 years, so lots of angst about this. While the Senate is going off to rethink things and come back with another bill, I um, think it's, it's worthwhile looking at the U.S. healthcare system. One of the big issues with it that makes it suboptimal is the fact that healthcare in the United States is tied to employment. This is very unusual in the world, but we have developed a system in this country where you get healthcare in association with your job. You need to have a good job. It's very good for companies that work at big or com people, rather, that work at big, stable companies that can afford it. It's also fine for the companies. At Business Insider, for example, we are happy to help provide great health care for our team. We want that for them. But for everybody else, you're kind of screwed because it is very difficult to buy health care outside the, uh, the confines of a company where, where you can actually pool things. This is what Obamacare was designed to do. Obviously far from perfect, plenty left to fix, but part of the problem is that our system is tied to healthcare. And it's interesting to look at the history of that. This really came from, first started with companies in dangerous industries like mining would have doctors on staff to help when they were accidents. And so there were, there, we started an early transition in the 1800s of having companies associated with healthcare. Then things really got going um, during World War II where we had wage controls. So companies couldn't raise wages, so what they did was improve benefits for employees to try to attract them. And that started, company provided healthcare. Then after the war, lots of tax advantages where this became a tax deductible expense for companies. Again, very different than being on your own, where it's not often tax deductible. Then, when folks figured out in the 1970s, hey, the problem is that not everybody is working. We have a lot of older people and poorer people. Then we brought in Medicare and Medicaid to fill things in. And over the course of those 20 years, from the 1950s to the 1970s, we went from fewer than 10% of Americans having health insurance to more than 70%. So that's where our employer-sponsored health care system came from. Um, again, the problem is, and this contributes to why the United States has one of the highest per capita expenditures on health care and some of the worst results in the first world, um, is this problem of it being tied to employment. We need to have a system that covers people any time, whether they are working or not, in an affordable way. And, and one of the ways that it seems that we can do that is with some sort of public option, something that looks like Medicare or Medicaid, that you can opt into if you wish to, again, outside of your employment. But that is the other unfortunate thing about the U.S. healthcare system. It is tied to employment, which ultimately is okay for those who are employed, but not okay for everybody else. Is the eight plus year bull market coming to an end? And more pertinently, is the little correction in tech stocks the harbinger of a much bigger drawdown? We're joined by Julian Emanuel from UBS, strategist Julian. First of all, congratulations on calling the mini tech crash. Very well done. Well, let's start with the market as a whole. What, sure. are, what are we in for the next six months? Sure. Well, you know, there is a concern that we're eight and a half years into this bull market. But what we found, you look at 30 years of market history, bull markets don't end unless there's a recession coming. And as, tr as hard as we might look, we don't see a recession in 17, and we don't see one in 18. So by that token, we think the market could be weak, led by tech over the next several weeks, perhaps into the fall. But ultimately, it's a dip that needs to be bought. So we'll come back to tech. 
No concerns about the yield curve, which everyone is talking about, is flattening. Some people say this is a harbinger of recession. There's definitely concern there. Um, you know, again, when you look back at history, and history is a good guide, particularly we're in these unknown waters where the Fed is coming off zero interest rates. But what we've seen is that the yield curve tends to flatten to zero before there is a recession. And our view is, is that the Fed, is as much as they want to hike and intend on hiking, are definitely cognizant of the messages that the yield curve is sending out. And so they'll manage that as well as we get into the fall. So you see no problems 17 and 18, but you do refer in your reports to late cycle for the market. So what does that mean? When should we be worried? Well, so late cycle means that actually the Fed themselves, as they have so often in the past, tend to sound the bell for the start of the end of the bull market. But that cycle can take as much as three or four years. So when they first raised rates in December of 15, we started on the clock. However, if you think about this recovery, it's been low and slow. And actually, as, as much as the bull market has run, the gains have actually been low and slow over the course of eight years. So we see that stretching out uh, in time, if not in amplitude as well. So talk about tech. This has been a can't miss trade for many years. But everyone was startled recently when the FANG stock suddenly corrected. What do you see there? Well, it's been can't miss if you've held it over the long haul and, you know, sort of put away your uh, portfolio uh, periods in 2000, obviously in 2007. If you're a technology investor, you have to be prepared for volatility. And what we've seen over the last six to nine months is incredibly low volatility in technology that really doesn't reflect the risks and the emotions that go into investing in an area like technology. And when tech is trading at volatility lower than utilities, you know, the most boring, you know, sort of yield sensitive area in the market, that to us is an imbalance that in talking to our clients, we felt like the ones who were invested were getting nervous and the ones who weren't invested had fear of missing out. And so to us, you just sort of hit this emotional peak where we felt like the gains in the FANG names in particular were making people uncomfortable. Not at all unusual to see this kind of sell-off, which we do think has a little bit further to run. So sell-off has further to run, but we're not done. Correct. Correct. A again, I think to make the claim that technology as a sector is done with a capital D is basically making the claim that the bull market itself is going to end. And when we look at it again, just going back, you know, we don't see sort of a period of you know, 2000, 2003, um, you know, a deep bear market. What we see is a correction. Ultimately, sometime in the next 12, 24, 36 months, the Fed may overdo it as they typically do and the bull market draws to a close but we don't see that at this point. So you had some fascinating observations in a recent note called High Fives about the fact that five technology stocks have driven a significant percentage of the S&P's run so far this year and others. And in prior periods in history, when the strength of the bull market has been that concentrated, we've then seen a wide variety of different outcomes over the next few years. So talk about what we can expect there. We have. We have. Uh, you know, in 93, you saw that. Um, and you had a sideways year in 94. And then actually when the Fed finished its rate hiking cycle at, uh, at the end of 94, you had, you know, the start of really what one might call the irrational exuberance period um, led by technology stocks. 99, obviously, we all know, was sort of the height of the bubble. That didn't end well. But again, if you sold into, you know, what happened in 2000, um, you know, depending on your time horizon, you, you know, you left much too early because since 2000, these stocks are up thousands and thousands of percents. Uh, we saw the same thing in 2007. That, of course, uh, was the start of the financial crisis. But again, the message is it's not uncommon and it doesn't necessarily have to, quote unquote, end in tears. So which are these five stocks? And certainly in some of the examples that you put forth of the next 12 months, they did end in tears. In fact, a lot of tears. So there's that risk, too. They did. It's, it's you know, basically the household fang names and the, the M for, uh, uh, for Microsoft, which is, is really had, you know, tremendous gains over the course of the last 30 years as well. Um, but, but the message for us is, is when we look at it, the earnings power of these companies and the valuations 
although they may be somewhat uncomfortable. First of all, they're nowhere near the excesses that we saw uh, earlier towards the bubble peaks. Uh, but again, the earnings power of these companies is very, very profound. And in a world where growth continues to be difficult to come by, um, that's something that we think investors will take notice of. You've also talked about Trump, President Trump and the economy, and pointed out that when President Trump was elected, there was this expectation of reflation, economic growth and inflation that seems to be fading now. What is your view and Wall Street's view of, of the prognosis for that? Well, the nice thing is, is that the confidence that was engendered, not so much about the Trump administration itself, but the whole idea that Washington as a place was going to turn more business friendly is something that has remained on both the part of business people and consumers. So in a lot of ways, some of the work we've done in the past is that when confidence remains elevated, it has the potential to be a self-fulfilling prophecy for the economy. We haven't quite seen that yet. We're very watchful and very mindful of the incoming data over the next several months. I sort of talk about data dependency as the Fed does. So for us, that's going to be critical. Um, you know, the market as a whole has become comfortable with the fact that policy implementation is going to take longer than expected. So that's okay. But what we do need to see is the economy picking up a little steam. And so we're waiting for that data. And does the market believe still that tax reduction, regulatory simplification and reduction will still happen? Yes. Uh, you know, the expectations have been sort of pushed out. Originally, if you, if you look back uh, post-election, you know, there was a thought it was going to happen in either the second or the third quarter of, of 2017. I think people are you know, sort of more tempered, thinking along the lines of first quarter to second quarter of 2018. But there is an expectation that there will be some sort of policy benefit. So to summarize Julian Emanuel's view, lull in the summer, but strong finish to the year in both the S&P and technology. Exactly. You know, you be patient as an investor. This is a correction. We haven't had a correction in over a year since, since Brexit. Uh, it's something that we may perhaps have uh, forgotten to be used to, but ultimately it's going to be another buying opportunity. Julian, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Henry. Our next guest called the bottom in 2009, just a month early, then was all the way up on board, and has recently turned cautious. Tom Lee is the head of research at Fundstrat Global Advisors. Tom, you recently cut your estimates on the S&P 500 and are saying the market will be lower, dare I say it, by the end of the year. Yes, that's right. It's, um, and it's, a, it's an uncomfortable call, to be honest, because uh, one, our, our clients don't like the idea that Look, a market being so strong actually has downside risk, and of course, it's um, you know it's tough for people to find ideas in that environment. But you do point out some sectors of the market you think will continue to do well, like the Fang stocks that have done so well thus far. Yeah, that's right. I think that investors really need to scrutinize where true earnings power is coming from um, in this market, and, and it's coming from Fang. Um, and these are secular growers, right? Growing 25% top line and 30% earnings. Um, but the rest of the growth is really being driven by resource sectors, financials, um, and even telecom turning next year. So it's not your traditional stocks that are growing at 10%. I mean, the market's really got a median growth rate of like eight or nine, and then it's these other sectors that are really producing that double-digit gain. And so what is it that causes you to be cautious on the market overall? Uh, there's a couple things. One, you know, so we think that there still has to be a linkage between underlying fundamental growth and market valuation. So two ways to look at it. One is median PE. Median PE is now um, close to 19 times forward. That's, it's the 91st percentile median PE over the last 30 years. The only time it's actually been higher was 98 to 99. Um, so I think it's really stress stretching valuations unless earnings really pick up. The second is, is looking at market cap to GDP. And it's currently, if you strip out the global market cap, right, pro profits earned overseas, that ratio is around 89%. Outside of the 99 period, you have to go all the way back to 1929 to find the market trading at a higher market cap to GDP ratio. And as in the 1990s, 
folks seem to have a lot of very good reasons why the market is where it is and often point out, hey, if we're akin to 1998, we've still got all of that 1999 upside. Yes. How do you time a, an exit or a lightning when you're looking at valuation? Yeah. Well, I think it's, I mean, that's the tension, right, in our view, because I, I don't necessarily think we have a business cycle turn coming and a recession. But we have a nominal GDP problem. Um, if real growth is only two and inflation expectations are falling, that means nominal growth is only going to be three. Earnings growth is really essentially going to be 3%. And I think when you see estimates out there that look for 12% growth next year, it's grounded on this view that inflation picks up and real growth picks up. And if neither takes place, then earnings are too high, and which is the reason we, we think estimates are, are actually way too high out there. But you don't see a recession. You think this is just a pause for a while? Um, yeah, I think that if I was to stage it, like let's say it's on hands of a clock, I think right now it looks like it's 9 o'clock. <clears throat> so we still have uh, several years of expansion ahead. But the yield curve spread, the 1030, is telling us the economy is a lot more advanced. So you know, maybe closer to 10 or 11. And what do you, when you look at the Trump administration, President Trump was elected, lots of excitement about tax cuts and regulatory rollbacks and so forth. A lot of that has not happened on the time frame that people thought. As you look forward, are you expecting to see some improvement there? Um, you know, when, when, when we first heard talk about stimulus, tax reform and health and Obamacare repeal, I think it from a consensus perspective, it's unrealistic what people were expecting. And I think now we're starting to see a sobering, ex some sobering of expectations, right? So tax rates maybe at 28, which is essentially no change. Um, I think the only place to be really optimistic about for business is, is deregulation. Um, because over the last eight years, it's probably seen one of the greatest increases in regulatory burdens for corporates. Um, just three sectors, banks, energy and the industrial sector have almost $85 billion a year of incremental cost associated with uh, major regulations. And so given the mix of what you're seeing with the stock market, are there other assets that you're recommending? What are you telling your clients to do? Park and wait it out or just diversify into other sectors? Well, it's, uh, you know, in, in some ways I still think high yield is a great way to get exposure because you get 80% of the return of the stock market with half the volatility. So I think in some ways, if this cycle's proven anything, high yield is actually a, a really good business. And you know, when you look within high yield, you know, you can always isolate sectors. So you don't have to have high yield with energy. You can buy high yield without energy, or you can buy the triple C part of high yield and you know, you know, pick up close to seven, eight percent yield. So I think high yield's a great asset class. I think it's really proven itself in this cycle. And I think what's interesting is um, I still think there's room for alternative currencies in people's portfolios, whether it's gold or you know, cryptocurrencies. Yeah, I think it, it, it's, they're actually security, so they're not true currency trades, but they're anti-currency trades. And then lastly on the stock market, one of your recent notes, you talked about how secular bull markets usually last more than 20 years. This one is only eight years yes. old. Our, we headed for a correction on that in a secular bull market, or are we still in this workout phase from the 1990s? Yeah, it's, uh, I, I think, um, so if we look at these long bull market periods, the secular bull markets, which is multiples expanding, that 82 to 99 period included the 87 crash, which market fell 40%. So I think there's room for a huge drawdown that would reset expectations, but it's, it wouldn't change the view that maybe we still have higher prices at 2025. I think the problem today is that market growth, market the rise in the market has way been ahead of, of GDP growth. So, Tom, great to have you. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, great to be here. That's it for this week. Thank you very much for joining us. As always, a big thank you to Fidelity Investments for presenting the show. We'll see you next week.